all right um it's 8 30 so i'm gonna get started uh, we're supposed to have a guest today but i guess they're not here um me. hello trying to start class here uh yeah i can't really talk if you guys are having or gals are having conversation um yeah i mean yeah, anyway so yeah we were supposed to have a guest but they're not here um so just one last time so just one last time uh this uh, consulting thing is uh, consulting group is recruiting. Yeah, so if you're interested in that, you can go to their thing. So last class okay, we so whenever we're so oh, many sure. circuits with pastors and doctors, I forgot to <laughs> we will always be so apparently I uh, didn't delete the recordings when I made that video, but now it's going to function at five. All right, cool. I should have just ad-libbed and then seen if you could yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so last class we basically went over how to apply KCL and KVL to uh, circuits that have both capacitors and inductors. And basically we said that the same rules still apply. The main distinguishing feature is that now we have a bigger table of IV relations. Um, so basically the voltage for a resistor is just I times R for a capacitor. It's a uh, one over C, the integral of I and so on. And so that's basically all that changed so for example, if we wanted to solve this LC circuit here, or sorry, RC, RL circuit, because it has a resistor and an inductor, uh, we would we could apply KVL at this node. So last class, we mainly applied KCL. So that's why I'm going over a KVL example. And then what we would simply have to say is that the current coming into this node, so I in, has to be equal to the current across going out of the resistor plus the current going out of the inductor. Um, so that's kind of uh, the the way we would solve this. At this point, we we know that the current of the resistor is related to uh sorry it's related to the voltage across the resistor by uh, B, the, the voltage drop divided by the resistance. So we can say that I in 
is equal to the voltage so T divided by the resistance plus IL. And then at this point, we know that the voltage drop across the resistor and the inductor will be the same because they're in parallel. So is that clear why the voltage drop across the resistor and inductor are the same? Okay, so at this point, we could go to this table here and we could see here that uh, the voltage across the inductor is equal to L D I D T, and we could plug that in, and then we would get our differential equation. So that's one way we could solve this. An alternate way would be to, so basically we could just for V plug this in, and then we would get our differential equation. Alternatively, uh, we could just go here and write it in terms of the, oh, sorry in terms of the voltage. So we could say I in equals V sub T over R plus one over L, the integral negative infinity to tau V sub T, D, oh, so V sub tau D tau. And then what would we have to do to this equation to turn it into a, uh, into a valid differential equation. Does anyone remember? Yes? Differentiate both sides. Yeah, so then we would take the derivative of both sides, uh, ddt, ddt, and then uh, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral would just disappear, and then we would end up with something like this. So there are multiple ways to uh, analyze these circuits. Uh, the the general objective is always the same to one uh, as, as before, to end up with an equation that has a single unknown. So you're either gonna be solving for a current that you don't know or for a voltage that you don't know and uh, a bunch of derivatives. So that's kind of the, the main objective when you're deriving these equations. So that, that was the derivation of the equations and what we went over last lecture. Over the next couple of weeks, we will actually be going over a lot of examples of how to do this, and I hope that you will get more comfortable at it. Um, but now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and look more into just, once I have this equation, what do I do? So how do I actually solve this? Um, and so how do I solve differential equations? And for now, we're gonna uh, have an approach that's very genetic, generic, and uh, it's just to get you going so that you can solves some simple circuits. Later on in class, we'll, at, we'll actually spend quite a bit of time developing more powerful techniques based on Laplace's equation. Uh, and they will make this analysis a lot easier. But for now, we're just kind of giving you a heuristic way of solving differential equations, will, which will work so that you can get going, basically. All right, so <clears throat> last lecture, we also went over how to solve homogeneous ODEs. And in particular, we said uh, that a homogeneous ODE was when you had an equation of the form where the left-hand side is zero or right-hand side, depending on how you write your equation. And then on the other side of your equation, you basically have a polynomial of derivatives. So basically, A0 times your unknown quantity, A1 times the first derivative of your unknown quantity, a2 times the second derivative of your own quantity, and then up to order n. So this particular equation we, would be called an nth order differential equation because the highest order derivative that you see in the equation is n. Um, and it's homogeneous because it has a zero on the left-hand side. If you had another unknown quantity y, so this is what you know, what you know, and that thing that you know is not zero, we call it inhomogeneous. Um, additionally, we, we kind of uh, developed that methodology for solving these homogeneous ODEs. And in particular, we just said we were going to assume that the solution was of the form e to the lambda t. And then the, once we plug that into our equation, what ended up happening is that uh, the differential equation now became a polynomial in terms of lambda. 
So basically, because the derivative, the nth derivative of e to the lambda t is actually equal to lambda to the n e to the lambda t, what ended up happening is that uh, each of these things just became a multiplication with lambda to whatever power of derivative. So uh, this one has no derivative, so the, uh, it multiplies by one. This one has a first order derivative, so it multiplies by lambda. A2 has a second order derivative, so it multiplies by lambda squared and so on. Um, and so we ended up with converting this equation into a polynomial uh, for which we have to find its roots. And that's what we ended up calling the characteristic equation. So that was last lecture. And then we said, okay, now we just have to find the roots of this equation. Uh, of course, these are difficult problems. I think up to fifth order people have systematized it. But uh, in this class, we're only going to be solving ODEs up to second order. So I hope all of you are comfortable with your quadratic formula and finding the roots of a linear function or where it crosses zero. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, so you will have to solve an equation like this and you're gonna get two roots if it's second order, one root if it's first order. And, and then that's gonna tell you that your solution is kind of uh, of the form, uh, it's gonna be of the form, um, C1 e to the lambda, 1t plus c2 e to the lambda 2t. And then in the case of second order, you might have repeated roots. So sometimes the polynomial might be of the form lambda plus uh, uh, t squared. That's our place. Oh, God. Lambda plus uh, some constant squared equals zero. So in that case, you have repeated roots. And so whenever you have repeated roots, all you're gonna have to do is you will, your solution will look of the form plus t c2 e to the lambda to t. Um, and additionally, if you have uh, imaginary roots, you will have to use sines and cosines, or you could still write it like this, and you know that by Euler's formula, the e to the i times uh, some lambda t is really uh, cosine plus i sine uh, lambda t. So, so either way, either way, these are the only two particular cases. This is a minor detail. We will actually be looking at that much more when we look at RLC circuits and these kinds of things. At this point, you just have to know that to solve homogeneous OD, you just have to find the roots of the characteristic equation and to go from your ODE to a characteristic equation, all you have to do is take the polynomial order of your derivative and replace that by a lambda. So first order derivative becomes lambda, second order derivative becomes lambda squared, nth order derivative becomes lambda to the n, uh, and so on. Go ahead. In general, is it common? <laughs> to replace like x of t with like b to the something just to kind of have its characteristic equivalent. Yeah, so in, in general for linear homogeneous ODEs, the solutions will always be of this form. Uh, and then depending on the order, you will have multiple possible solutions. And to each of these solutions, there will be one constant associated, which will we, talk, we will talk about once we're solving circuits, we will find how to find these constants and it will be kind of, uh, it will be determined by initial conditions. Okay, so that's a homogeneous OD. And then, so last lecture, we started kind of talking about how to solve inhomogeneous ODs. And we said that we were going to essentially guess that the the solution to the inhomogeneous uh, equation was of the form of the forcing term. Um, and so we, we went over an example and then we ran out of time, mm -hmm. basically. Here, I'm gonna actually give you the full heuristic of how we're gonna solve a differential equation uh, once we have it for a circuit along with its initial conditions. So in particular, 
from each of the circuits that we're going to be looking at, we will have to, we will always have to get as a first step, the differential equation, which we talked about last lecture. So basically something that looks like this. And like I said, in this class, we're only gonna have A0 plus A1 D D P X of P plus A2 D D T squared squared X of T equals uh, y sub t. So that's kind of the most complicated thing we'll solve in this class, just because the this is the simplest system that has all of the complexity that you can get out of an ODE. Okay. Um, yeah, so, this, so we're gonna get from our circuits an equation that looks like this for RL, RC circuits, A2 will always be zero for RLC circuits, for LC circuits, A2 will be non-zero, basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's kind of the equation we're gonna get. But we're also going to get an init initial conditions or the state of the system at time equals zero. So what's the voltage at time equals zero? What's the derivative of the voltage at time equals zero? And we typically need as many initial conditions as the order of the differential equation. So typically for R, L, and RC circuits, we only need one initial condition. For R, R, RLC circuits, we need two initial conditions. So this is the, the mathematical statement uh, that we will always kind of uh, have to solve for the next four weeks. And here's a strategy that we're gonna employ at least for the first two, three weeks. Okay, so effectively what we're going to do is we're first going to find what we call the particular response or the solution to the inhomogeneous equation. And so basically the way we're going to do that is we're going to guess that our solution is of the form uh, of a constant times our input function. And then what we're going to do is just basically plug this expression into the ODE. And then hopefully we can solve for the constant, for that for this constant. And in this class, we will always get lucky. So you will always be able to solve for the constant. So I say hopefully because this doesn't always work, but we will choose circuits where it does work. Okay, so once we have uh, that constant, then what's gonna happen is that the solution that we pick might not necessarily uh, satisfy the initial conditions. And so what we're gonna do is add zeros to both sides of the equation. And so we're gonna basically solve our equation for the homogeneous response, meaning that on the left-hand side, we plug in an X that doesn't affect our right-hand side or our, our uh, forcing force function and then we're gonna solve it, and then we're gonna use that to find the coefficients that match the initial conditions. So that's kind of that's gonna be our overall strategy. So so far, you should know how to do this part and this part separately. Now we're gonna actually put it together. I think it's this seems a little bit complicated because uh, it's abstract. So I'm gonna go over an example, and hopefully we'll that will kind of clear up what uh, the steps are. But this is going to be the general heuristic. So first you find what we call X particular, then you find X homogeneous, and your total solution is both. Um, yeah. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be going a lot up over a lot of these examples, and it will always be the same five steps. All right. So let's look at an example. So last class, we actually went over this, but we'll just kind of, to recap, go over it again. So let's say we have this particular equation here and they gave us that R equals uh, one ohm, C equals two farads. And then they also gave us that the voltage is actually equal to the initial voltage at time equals zero across the capacitor equals zero. So we have that Vn sub T is equal to two D D T of VC of T plus V, C, sub T. So now we're gonna find X particular. So what's the first step? V, C, particular, sub T is equal to 
Does anyone know what B, what I should set BC particular to? Oh, and they told us that B in sub T is E to the negative T, sorry. So E to the negative T. So what should I set uh, B in sub, so go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah, so we're basically going to guess, guess. So there is no logic to this, we're guessing. Boom. We're just going to guess that it's going to be a constant, which we don't know at this point, times uh, e to the negative t. So that's step one. And then step two is to what do we do now that we know what this particular solution is? Go ahead. You plug it back in the yeah, so you, we, we're going to plug it back in. And so now we're going to have e to the negative t is equal to 2, the derivative of constant p e to the negative t plus c p e to the negative t. And then, um, yeah, I don't know how to take derivatives, but hopefully I do this right. e to the negative t equals negative 2 e to the negative t times this constant c p plus c p e to the negative t. Okay, so at this point, can anyone tell me what CP is? Or is it clear to everyone? So what can I do to this equation here? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so we can factor the CP out and then we're gonna get basically uh, e to the negative t equals negative 2 uh, plus 1 cp e to the negative t. And then the cp's cancel. And so now we're going to get, uh, what is it, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So cp is equal to negative 1. Yes, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, so CP is equal to negative one. So now we have our solution, which is that VCP equals E to the negative T. Cool. So so we're done, right? Uh, well, not quite, because if I plug in time equals zero for this, what I will get is E to the negative zero negative, which is equal to negative one. So VCP of zero is equal to negative one, but as you can see, that's not equal to zero. Uh, and so as a result, we're not satisfying the initial condition. And so to satisfy the initial condition, now we're gonna basically solve the homogeneous ODE, and then we're gonna add zeros to both sides, so to the, the equation, and as a result, we'll both match the forcing function and the initial condition. All right, so here I kind of wrote it cleanly just because I know my handwriting is not uh, artful, for lack of a better word. Um, so yeah, so basically you have this already in your notes, which is what I just wrote on the previous slide. Um, so we our first step is just to assume that x of p is of the form of a constant times the forcing function. And in this case, the forcing function is e to the negative t, so it's just some constant times e to the negative t. And then the second step is just to plug in our guess into the equation uh, in order to figure out what that constant is. So now that's what we just did in the previous slide. Now we're gonna, now that we have that part of the solution, now we need to actually uh, add zeros to both ends, both sides of the equation. So effectively, remember we were solving uh, V, what is it? Uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So e to the, what is it? Uh, e to the negative t equals 2 d dt of vc plus vc sub t. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say e to the negative t plus 0. Uh, and this plus, this 0 that we're actually solving for is just to match our initial conditions. So now we've already solved this part, check. So now we're going to solve the 0 part of the equation. And so to do that, we have to solve a homogeneous ODE. So what's the first step to solve a homogeneous ODE? Yeah. 
push it to the Yeah, 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 yeah. Lambda plus one. I'm just laughing because it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the first step. So sorry. Uh okay. So yeah. Um anyway. That that sometimes students get confused because I ask a lot of obvious questions and then they're like, is he really asking that? But I don't know, it's just a habit. Okay. So now that we know the characteristic equation, that allows us to find our lambda. So in this case, the next step is to find the roots. So lambda is just going to be equal to negative one half. Very simple. Yeah. OK, and then how does our solution look like if lambda is e to the negative, if lambda is negative one half? Our homogeneous solution, yeah? We see one e to the negative. Have yeah, x homogeneous. So plus t or c two t times e to the negative one half. No, no, no. So basically, that's when you have repeated roots. So in this case, you just have one root. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, it's if you have like to the second power. Yeah, which we have that first. Power. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah, you have the right the right idea. So our solution will actually be v c homogeneous of t equals a constant homogeneous times e to the one half t. Okay, so now all we have to do is match our initial condition, which was that uh, b c of zero has to be equal to zero. So we have that uh, b c of zero, which will be equal to v c particular at zero plus v c homogeneous at zero has to be equal to um, negative one, which is what the B homogeneous, B C at particular at zero is, plus C homogeneous E to the, oh, that should be a negative, negative one half T zero, which of course this is just one. And so, and this should all be equal to zero because that was our initial condition. So what should the C homogeneous be? Yeah, one, exactly. Okay, so now we have that C homogeneous is one. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we get here. And then, so now we have our total solution, which is the B particular we derived in the previous two slides ago, plus the V homogeneous that we derived uh, in our, uh, that we just arrived basically. And that's how we're gonna solve these differential equations. Are there any questions on how to solve differential equations? No? Okay. Okay, so now you can actually analyze RL and RC circuits because basically, as long as you have, you can derive the differential equation and you can analyze the differential equation in principle. So I guess we're done here for now. Um, well, not quite, right? Because I haven't told you, how do you find these initial conditions? Uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So one thing is for a lot of questions, you will be given these initial conditions. If you are not giving them to you, you can assume where, well, yeah. You can assume that the circuit has been on for a very long time. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Before we do that, now we're going to actually solve an example circuit from beginning to end now that we have this uh, developed this ODE method for analyzing circuits. Okay, so here we're given that Vn is equal to 3e to the negative 3t. And we're given that R equals 2 ohms and L equals 1 Henry. So 2, 1, H. Uh, Omega. And uh, so we're asked, what is ILS of T for time equals greater than zero? Uh, we're also given the initial condition. So here we're told that ILS of zero equals one amp. 
So step one would be determine the ODE. Um, so how would I do this? Does anyone have a way to get me started? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we can apply KVL. So basically the voltage around the loop has to be zero. So we have that VN equals VR plus VL. And then uh, we know that VR is equal to uh, R times I. So R, and we know that the uh, yeah, and uh, the, 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 this is I L. And we also know that the current going through the resistor is the same as the current going through the inductor. So that's just equal to I L. And then we have plus V L, which what's another way to write V L in terms of I? The inverse of that, but yeah, good, right, right idea. So you just need to learn the table basically, but it's L D I D T. Okay, so we have our differential equation. So basically, uh, how do we know we have our differential equation? Because the only unknown here, we have one unknown and we have a bunch of derivatives basically. So we're good to go. All right, so now let's plug in some numbers. So we have kind of three e to the negative three t equals r, which is two i l so t plus what is l? Oh, thanks. It's just one d d t of i l so t, and so that's our differential equation. And we also have that i l so zero equals one. So at this point, this is a math problem. It's no longer a circuits problem. You just need to be able to do the arithmetic for this. And we have to apply the uh, ODE solving techniques we just described earlier. All right, so determine the ODE. Um, I divided everything by by two in our in the in the Next slide, so that's why it's three halves and uh, uh, one half for the DILDT. And so now we got this equation. And so now we need to find the particular solution. So what's kind of the first step of finding this particular solution? Does anyone remember? So, oh, yeah, what's the first thing? <laughs> yeah, so basically you just guess, guess that your uh, particular solution is of the form of the right-hand side. So that's the first step. And then the second step would be to plug it into the differential equation. So now we're gonna plug in our guess. So there is no method to this. I It's just a guess that uh, I know someone's gonna ask me like, why did you choose that? There is no logic to it. We are blind faith. It's kind of like you forgot your combination and your, your password and then you just try one that you tried in the past and then it doesn't work, then you try again and eventually you get lucky or you get locked out. But this time in this class, we won't get locked out. Mm -hmm. But you had a question. It's like the reason that the three of the is like CB, is that like the four bearing constant? Yeah, we didn't put the three halves because it's just you can absorb it into the, but but you can put it there and you'll still get the right answer. Okay, uh, so now we plug it back in. So now we have uh, three over two e to the negative three t equals uh, CP e to the negative three T plus one half. When we take the derivative of this, we're just gonna get negative three E to the negative three T. Um, and so at this point, oh, that should be a CP. So now we have, this is all equal to 
oh god uh, one plus one minus three over two one minus three over two c p e to the negative three t equals three over two e to the negative three t and then this is just the uh, negative one half. So the twos cancel and you get negative three. So did everyone get the same thing or yeah, maybe, no. Okay, so now we have CP and so now we know our particular solution. Um, at this point, are we done? No. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, so part of the problem right now is that our we don't we're not matching our initial condition because our current at time equals zero will be three amps, and we got had that our current at time equals zero should be one. So now we have to uh, determine the homogeneous solution. Okay, so how do we determine the homogeneous solution? So the first step is to find the characteristic equation. So what is the characteristic equation? Does anyone know? Yeah. One plus one half lambda. Yeah, so we have one plus one half lambda equals zero. And then we can basically get that uh, lambda equals two, negative two. So just FYI, if you ever get a positive lambda when you're solving the homogeneous solution, you did something wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the circuits that we're solving will always have exponentially decaying solutions. Um, if they will never have an exponentially increasing solution, if they do, you should step away. <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, so basically, now that we have the homogeneous solution, the, the, the lambda, now we can find the homogeneous solution, which is of the form C homogeneous E to the negative 2T. And how do we find these this constant here? Does anyone remember it? Yeah. Yeah. So now we can use our initial condition. So we have that I L sub zero is equal to one, which is just equal to I L particulars of T plus I, oh, sorry, of zero plus I L homogeneous of zero, which is just equal to if I plug in zero here, I'm going to get negative three plus C homogeneous. And so that will tell me that C homogeneous is equal to four. And so now we have our solution for our circuit. Is that uh, more or less clear to everyone? Yeah, yeah, cool. You? I have a question. So like, when you're determining like I L sub P, and you're just guessing, um, can it be wrong? And if so, how do you know? Oh, it just won't work. Like oh. your algebra won't work. Okay. You, you notice how all of these things, it always just cancels out magically. Yeah, yeah. yeah it just won't, like, that won't happen. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, it's just that uh, to begin class, we're always going to be giving you VNs where it will work. Right. Um, later on in class, once we use Laplace transforms and we enter this convolution, you'll be able to solve any right-hand side. But for now, our goal is to actually just get you comfortable deriving these differential equations but we need to give you a way to solve them so that you can kind of start solving circuits. So go ahead. The Oh, oh yeah. So that's the characteristic equation. So if I plug in zero here, and then if I assume that the solution is C H E to the Lambda T, if I assume that the solution is e to the lambda t, then I'm going to get kind of e to the lambda t plus one half 
lambda e to the lambda t. And then when you factor them out, you get kind of one plus one half lambda e to the lambda t. Um, yeah, in general, kind of, I, I'm giving you kind of the logic behind it, but in general, when you're solving these things, you should just basically look at the power and then just replace that with a lambda. So if it's to the first order derivative, it's just lambda, second order derivative, lambda squared. Uh, you don't need to go through this extra arithmetic. Um, it will always work out. That's why we call it the characteristic equation. But any other questions at this point? Yeah, you? No? OK. All right, no more questions. So now we can start with today's topic. 37 minutes into lecture. Yeah. So for our circuits, um, there are kind of some requirements that uh, the each type of element has its own voltage uh, current relationships. But the fact that this uh, voltage across a capacitor is under a derivative implies that the voltage must always be continuous. So if you have a capacitor and I connect a source minus, I connect a, a capacitor, this capacitor is kind of uncharged and I connect a source at time equals zero, that voltage cannot jump like that because what that would mean is that your current would be infinite. Because uh, if you have a discontinuous function, what's the derivative of a discontinuous function? Yeah, it's undefined basically. And so as a result, the voltage across a capacitor will always be continuous. So this cannot happen for the voltage across the capacitor. This kind of thing can actually happen for a resistor and also it cannot happen for the current across an inductor. And that's just uh, that's just because these things, these IV relations have a derivative associated with them. So your voltage across a capacitor will always be continuous and your current across an inductor will always be continuous. And if you don't remember, if your equation has a derivative in it, that means that that, that quantity has to be continuous because otherwise that derivative would not exist at some transition state. So why is this important? Because now we're gonna look at switch circuits. <clears throat> so in particular, uh, we're gonna, in the oh God, next nine minutes, maybe not. I'm gonna introduce this topic and then we're gonna start talking about this uh, tomorrow in our next lecture in more detail. And then we're gonna move to RLC circuits because I don't think I can give this justice in 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so just FYI, this is why we have that catch up lecture at the end. So I knew this was gonna happen because of syllabus day. But anyway, all right, so, so yeah, when we're solving switch circuits, we're basically, what we mean by a switch circuit is we mean a circuit that now has a switch. So now we can have resistors, capacitors, inductors, and switches. So for example, this could be, uh, a light bulb and right now it's off and then you flip the switch at some time T1 and now it's on and then you're done studying. So now you switch it back off. And so that's basically what a switch circuit is. And so now we're gonna look into how to solve these circuits. And in general, what we're gonna do is we're actually going to solve them in increasing time. So we're gonna start from kind of the, time, the earliest time to the later time in a household way. And each time we will solve for the continuous quantities. So in the case of a capacitor, we will solve for the voltage across the capacitor. And in the case of inductors, we will solve for the current across inductors. Um, and these two things, again, are continuous because they, in the IV relations, they exist under a derivative. Okay, so, okay, so that's kind of the, the general strategy. So in particular, 
first thing we need to do is figure out what our initial condition is when we start, when we try to solve a switch circuit. And to find these initial conditions, we are going to assume that our circuit has been in the first in the pre in the first state for a very long time. So it's been on that for a very long time. And as it turns out, capacitors after a long time, so capacitors after long time behave as open. So what's gonna happen is that after a very long time, if you're in this state, what this will look like is basically like a resistor connected to an open circuit. And so in this particular case, what is the voltage drop across the capacitor? Yeah, so the volt such across the capacitor is zero because this terminal is grounded and there's no current flowing through here because this is an open circuit. And uh, this terminal is grounded. So we have that VC sub zero, or sorry, P1 right before the switch changes is equal to zero. Is it is it clear to everyone why that would be zero? Okay, so now we have our initial condition which is that at time T10, the voltage across the capacitor is zero. So then what we would have to do is now kind of, we've solved the circuit for all time less than T1. So now we have to solve it for time greater than T1. So now we basically can do what we've been doing, which is basically derive our differential equation. So in this case, we have five volts is equal to, uh, I times, sorry, uh, is equal to the voltage across the resistor plus the voltage across the capacitor. And then we can, we know that the, the voltage across the resistor is just I C times R. So there's only one current flowing through here plus VC. And then we can plug in this uh, derivative with respect to, we can use our relationship that IC is equal to C D D T of VC. So we have that uh, R C D D T of VC plus VC uh, equals five. So now we have our differential equation system. So basically we have our equation and we have our initial condition, T1 equals zero. And so now we can actually solve this differential equation using the methods that we just described uh, earlier, basically. Yeah, so yeah, and here I, I, I solved it. Um, we have three minutes, so I'm gonna stop here. Next lecture, we're gonna pick up with this and we're gonna talk about switch circuits and hopefully we'll get into LC. Yes, I have a quick question on the slide right at, right before. Yeah. So can you change VC instead of the IC? So VC is equal to one over C. You can, and you would get a different. The issue is that uh, when we're solving uh, switch circuits, we should stick to the continuous quantities. Ah. Yeah.